the next session topic is, so to speak, more on the uh, politics, uh, the transition to uh, uh, renewable energy, and we have two outstanding, uh, outstanding uh, speakers here today. Um, the first speaker is um, Professor James Hansen from the Earth Institute of uh, Columbia University, is uh, was director of the Goddard, NASA Goddard uh, uh, Research Institute. He has a degree in uh, physics, mathematics, astronomy, and uh, recently um, wrote an important, well-known book. This book is uh, Storms of My Grandchildren. Uh, he has testified in front of Congress for on uh, climate issues. He's one of the most well-known uh, climate scientists, in particular the impacts of this on the Earth. And uh, he is um, well-known, uh, not in the US, but also in Europe, and we hope uh, that we have some uh, controversies between American views, uh, which he will uh, also put forward at the end of his talk, and uh, the views of the Europeans, and the Europeans will be presented by Dr. Uh, Arthur Runge Metzger. Uh, he has his PhD in agricultural economics uh, from the University of Göttingen. She has, she has done extensive uh, field work in uh, Africa and has been uh, uh, for a while uh, head of the unit of climate, ozone and energy, but now is uh, head of the um, uh, director of climate uh, strategy and uh, international negotiation. So European uh, Commission started s slow with many, many issues in one uh, unit, like climate, ozone, energy, everything, and now they are split up and there are units for every um, topic, and the uh, unit he is the head of his climate change strategies. And uh, he is a well-known uh, European negotiator in climate, uh, treat and climate negotiations, and he probably has a different view uh, how to move toward uh, 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 how to uh, combat uh, climate change with mitigation policies or energy policies. So I hope we have a quite controversial discussion at the end, or at least two views. And I would invite the speakers to come to the front. First, uh, Professor Hansen is giving his uh, talk. You see the title here. So please uh, start. Thanks very much. Yeah, I will start um, in a more general way talking about the uh, climate system. Uh, very nice talks we had um, this morning. Um, so, I'll, But I'll say a few additional things. You know, the first thing I always start with is the fact that there is, continues to be this uh, tremendous gap between what is understood about global warming by the relevant scientific community and what's known by the people who need to know, and that's the public. Uh, and unfortunately, that gap uh, has increased in the last few years, despite the attention that this issue has received. It's hard for people to understand, the public to understand, that we have an emergency. But in fact, we do. And it's primarily from the simple fact that the climate system has a tremendous amount of inertia. So it doesn't respond quickly to the forces when humans begin to apply force into the system. Because the ocean is four kilometers deep, the ice sheets are thick, they don't respond quickly. And that means that the system has only partly realized the effects of the gases that are already in the atmosphere. The rest is still in the pipeline. And as we heard in this very nice talk, that you can push the system past tipping points beyond which the dynamics of the system begins to take over, and you get uh, consequences which you've lost control of. So um, that's the problem. Uh, the, the good news is that if we would deal with the problem, and I think there are ways to do it which actually make economic sense, um, there are many uh, co-benefits of doing that. Um, but just to mention a couple of these tipping points, well, we've already had discussion of the ice sheet 
a potential for instability of an ice sheet and, and the consequent sea level rise. And it's not a hypothetical uh, thing either. We know from the Earth's history that when an ice sheet does begin to disintegrate, you can get a five meter sea level rise in a century. Um, and it just the mechanism is particularly the warming of the ocean. I think it's one of the most important mechanisms uh, because as the ocean warms, it melts the ice shelves, the tongues of ice that come out from the ice sheet go into the ocean. And once those ice shelves are gone, because they buttress the ice sheet when they are there, if they're gone, then the ice can be discharged to the ocean much more rapidly. Um, but to mention another um, nonlinear problem where you can have tipping points, it's the uh, extermination of species which arises because of the interdependencies of the species upon each other. So if you drive some of them to extinction, you can reach to a, po a point where um, ecosystems can begin to collapse and you, you lose uh, a, a large fraction of the species. And again, this is not hypothetical because we know from the Earth's history that during some large climate changes, particularly uh, global warmings, We've uh, driven a large fraction, a large fraction of the species were uh, driven uh, to extinction. And those events were actually very slow. Uh, some of them look very rapid, like the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. It's a spike on the, on the paleoclimate uh, curves. But in comparison, but that was several mi millennia. Here we're talking about doing things in a century. It's, we're, mo we're, we're moving climate zones a lot faster than in those paleoclimate examples. Um, and of course, uh, adaptation is possible. I, I got this email from a, a man in Arkansas telling about uh, his noticing that in this north-south road that he was driving on, every year these armadillos would be a few miles further north. Uh, and armadillos have been around for more than 50 million years. They're one of the species that probably is more um, going to be more resilient to the climate change than some of the others. Uh, but we are now causing a given isotherm. If you average over a decade so that the temperature lines are smooth, we can see that the temperature lines are moving poleward at a rate of about 50 or 60 kilometers per decade, so three or four miles a year. Uh, that's a, a very unusual rate of uh, climate change. And, um, well, this, this is a photo I took a couple weeks ago. My, with my grandchildren, we, we plant um, milkweeds to try to, on our farm in Pennsylvania. Uh, because monarch butterflies can only eat milkweeds. And for, <coughs> mainly because of... Um, Oh, the, the defoliants and things. And there aren't, aren't as many milkweeds around um, for the monarch butterfly. And, and monarchs will uh, migrate all the way from Canada to Mexico every year. And they do it by means of two or three generations uh, making the flight um, and laying eggs and the next generation um, making the next leg. Um, and, but this year, we succeeded in only seeing two or three monarchs. And this one I, that I noticed uh, had a broken wing. And you can tell from the, the veins, the, the fat veins, that this is a female butterfly with has been kind of battered up. Um, but uh, she hung around for a couple of weeks, and now we've got about 20 uh, larva caterpillars, which presumably will soon be chrysalis and... and uh, and uh, produce butterflies that will go on the next leg. But those butterflies are going to have to go over Texas. <laughs> I don't know how much nutrition they're going to find uh, as they're trying to get to Mexico. Um, the, uh, <laughs> this is not a joke. <laughs> but, you know, I, I had, uh, after testifying in the 1980s, I decided, um, that I didn't like, I didn't want to be involved in this public aspect of this problem. So for 15 years, I avoided giving public presentations. And when I got requests from the media, I'd refer them to my friends, uh, Steve Schneider and Michael Oppenheimer, who are much more articulate and who could, um, 
and who liked to do that stuff. But finally, in uh, 2004, after about 15 years during the middle of the Bush era, I decided I wanted to give one public talk and try to <laughs> make clear with this gap between what was understood and what was known. And um, I, at that time, I just I was using my I had two grandchildren then, and I was using them to help explain the physics because it's extremely trivial. It's very simple. As you add CO2 to the atmosphere, you're making the the atmosphere at the infrared wavelengths, the wavelengths, the, normally the Earth absorbs a certain amount of energy from the sun and it radiates the same amount of energy at thermal infrared wavelengths to space and the climate is stable. But if you add CO2 to the atmosphere, it makes the atmosphere more opaque in the infrared. So the radiation to space is going to arise from a higher level in the atmosphere. And we can calculate that very precisely. Uh, the, uh, um, and because the temperature falls off with height in the atmosphere, the amount of radiation going to space is reduced. And that means the planet's out of energy balance. And with more energy coming in than going out, it'll warm up until balance is restored. But the question is then, what is that energy balance? Well, it's, we, we don't know it. The greenhouse gas forcing from pre-industrial to the present is about 3 watts which we can calculate very accurately. But the net forcing, because of the other stuff we're doing, mainly putting particles in the atmosphere, um, the net forcing is something between 1 and 2 watts. And Sophie was trying to say it was 2 watts, and Connor could only count 1 watt. But now we have some really spectacular measurements, uh, which help us really prove uh, where we stand. And that's beginning about a decade ago, these Argo floats began to be distributed around the world ocean, about more than 3,000 of them by different nations. Um, and as we're finally getting the calibration problems out of those, we're beginning to get to the point where we can measure the planet's energy balance. We can tell whether there's more energy coming in than there is going out. Uh, and. Um, we have a paper um, that's just been accepted for publications which, which uh, analyzes this data and concludes that over the last six years, when the data was most complete, the planet was out of balance by about, um, about 0.6 watts per meter squared, uh, which means that only there's there, therefore, there's more warming in the pipeline. Uh, and this, these last six years, we're doing a solar minimum. Um, so the average imbalance over a solar cycle is, is probably larger than that, probably three quarters of a watt at least. Um, and it also shows, by the way, that the people who think that the sun is, is, is a big cause of climate change, well, if the sun were the cause, then we should have a negative balance during the solar minimum. That, that is not a neg the sun is not a negligible factor, but compared to CO2, it's a small factor. So the, the planet, if you average temperature fluctuates each year because it's a noisy uh, climate system, uh, but if you average over enough time to take out El Ninos and La Ninas and even the solar cycle, then we see that over the last 30 years, temperature has been going up almost linearly. And it's increased about eight tenths of a degree Celsius over the planet, about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, about two and a half degrees Fahrenheit over land areas. But still, that's not enough compared to local uh, natural variability that it would mean that every place is getting warmer on a short time scale. So here's the annual mean temperature for last year. It's the temperature anomaly relative to 1951 to 1980. And then that's last winter, northern hemisphere winter. And um, well, last year was actually a very warm year, average over the planet. But still, there are some places that are colder than they were in 1950 to 1980. And especially if you look at a season, a single season, then the United States and Europe were uh, very cool uh, last winter, um, which uh, is not surprising. This is. Um, but if you look at the frequency of unusually warm seasons, it's uh, increasing. What was defined in the 1950 to 1980 period as uh, 
the 30 percent of the time that was was warmest was described as as warm, but now those seasons are occurring uh, twice as often, um, most of the time, and it's. Uh, these maps for the last four years, 2008, 9, 10, and 11, are the summer, the northern hemisphere summer, June, July, August, the temperature anomalies measured in standard deviations. So if it were still the same climate that existed in 1951 to 1980, then about 2 or 3% of the time you would have an anomaly that was in the red or the brown. Uh, more than two standard deviations on the high side. And um, you can see that in reality, it's the, if you add up the two numbers at the top of the graph, the ones greater than two standard deviations and between two and three and then greater than three, you see it was 21%, 29%, 39%, 32%. But where, where are these uh, unusually warm spots occur is, of course, a, a complicated matter. We, we know that uh, the area is, uh, in, is increasing and will continue to increase, but exactly where it's going to be each year, of course, we don't know. Last year, 2010, there was this brown area over Moscow, uh, a thousand-year event, 100-degree temperatures, and this year, Northern Mexico and Texas, um, the southern part of the United States, is under such an area. And um, the number of places that are going to get these anomalies is, uh, is increasing. Yeah. Now, you know, the criticism is made that, oh, well, we don't understand this because this is uh, based on climate models which are very unreliable and have lots of uncertainties. In fact, our, our understanding is based, most of all, in my opinion, on the history of the Earth. We know from how the, respond, the Earth responded to changes in boundary conditions, such as atmospheric composition and surface properties, from the paleoclimate record. And now we can see in this uh, dynamical uh, change that's going on now, we have uh, pretty good global observations of many quantities so we can see how the Earth is responding to these rapid changes in atmosphere and climate forcings. And the models help us to interpret what we observe in the record, but I don't think they're the main source of our understanding. And just to, and the other criticism that's uh, made, it was in fact made by the NASA administrator on National Public Radio said that, well, why should we worry about this human-made climate change? Because there have been much larger ones in the past. And uh, who are we to say what's the best climate uh, for humans anyhow? Um, and while he's right about the fact that there have been much larger climate changes in the past, uh, and those are actually very helpful to us in understanding what the implications are of um, the um, human-made changes. Uh, so this is the an um, estimate of deep ocean temperature changes over the last 65 million years, the Cenozoic era. During that time, the uh, well, in the first half of this period, up to about 34 million years ago, there were no large ice sheets on the planet. So sea level had to be, you know, 60 or 70 meters, uh, 200 feet higher, roughly, than it is now. Um, and, we know, and we know the main reasons for why uh, this large-scale climate change has occurred over this period. They had to be... Uh, associated with the um, change in atmospheric composition because you can either change the amount of energy coming into the planet or you can change something in the atmosphere, you can change something on the surface. Those can all affect the planet's energy balance and the dynamics of how things can affect things a bit too but not <laughs> with these uh, huge magnitudes. Um, and we know that the sun is a, 
is a well-behaved main sequence star. It's burning hydrogen to make helium. It's slowly getting brighter. Um, but 65 million years ago, it was four, about four-tenths of one percent dimmer than it is now. And since the Earth absorbs 240 watts of energy from the sun, that means it's, it was about one, one watt less energy. Uh, and we also know that the, the location of the continents was not that much different than it is now. So that the forcing due to the, the changes in the impact of that on the planet's energy balance is again of the order of a watt. But we also know that 50 million years ago, there was of the order of 1,000 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now there's 390, at pre-industrial is 280. But 1,000 ppm of CO2 means that relative to the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in the ice ages, that's a forcing of more than 10 watts. So it's much larger than these other forcings. So the CO2 um, was the primary driver of those long-term climate changes. And, and we know why roughly that occurred, because the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is a balance between the source of CO2, which is volcanoes, and the sink of CO2, which is primarily the weathering process, which carries, the rivers carry sediments to the ocean and deposit carbonates on the ocean floor, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And there's also some burial of organic matter, but it's mainly the weathering. And we know that the continental drift and the, the source is, can be highly time dependent on these sort of time scales. It depends upon where continents are moving through carbonate rich over, over subducting ocean floor beneath a moving continent where the ocean floor is carbonate rich. And um, 65 million years ago, India was still south of the equator. That was the one big thing that was different. But it was moving north at a rate of about 20 centimeters a year, which is uh, very rapid for continental drift. And it was plowing through a uh, carbonate-rich ocean because that, the major rivers of the world were, had been dumping into this, um, it was called the Tethys Ocean, now the Indian Ocean. So there was very, until, until India crashed into Asia 50 million years ago, we had this big source of CO2 and the planet was getting warmer. And then once India starts pushing up the Himalaya Mountains and the Tibetan Plateau, then you, you know, you've that source of CO2 is greatly diminished once it's completed its cruise across the ocean. And since then, the planet has been cooling off. And it, when it got cool enough that you began to have ice on Antarctica, then it, that feedback effect caused a rapid additional cooling. But the main point I want to make from this is that, yeah, they're, they're great. Uh, the natural changes of this sort are huge. Um, and typically at a rate of something like 100 ppm of CO2, you could have that large an increase in a million years, which is about one ten thousandth of a ppm per year. That's this imbalance between the source and the sink of CO2. But the human made rate of change is 2 ppm per year. <laughs> so we, we're orders of magnitude more powerful now than that sort of natural uh, force. And it also tells us, there are different ways to estimate uh, wh what the CO2 was at the time Antarctica froze over. Uh, uh, yeah, and I think uh, it's of the order of this 450 or 500 ppm. But in any case, if we burned all the fossil fuels, we would be more than that. So we'd be headed, heading the planet back to the ice-free state, which um, is going to, you know, all hell would break loose uh, during that transition. Now, to move to the, um, sat the observations during this last, um, the current era, this is one that was mentioned earlier, the, Late 1970s, we began to have satellite measurements that could measure the area of sea ice in the Arctic. And that fluctuates with, from year to year because of the weather that summer in the Arctic. But you can see that there's a very strong uh, decline. And um, as also was mentioned, the um, Northwest Passage, the fabled Northwest Passage is no longer a fable. 
you can uh, sail a boat from uh, the Atlantic um, to the Pacific Ocean. And again, that happened this year. In fact, this year, the sea ice 2011 is approximately the same as in 2007, maybe slightly uh, more. But um, it's um, an indication of the very rapid uh, changes going on. And there are clearly going to be effects on Greenland of the, Antarct of the Arctic becoming um, more ice free. Again, the area of melt on Greenland, the red area, fluctuates from year to year depending on the weather. But there's a, a strong trend toward getting larger area with summer melt. And that melt water will go to the low, low point on the ice sheet, melt, burrow a hole in the ice sheet all the way to the base of the ice sheet. And the water then will lubricate the base of the ice sheet and speed up the discharge of these giant icebergs to the ocean. As I mentioned earlier, even a more important effect may be the loss of ice shelves. But this is an, another mechanism that's involved in the processes. Still, we didn't know. You know, it was argued that, uh, well, we know that as the planet gets warmer, the atmosphere holds more water vapor. So you'll get more snowfall in the winter on Greenland, which will make the ice sheet bigger. But it's also melting more at the edges. So what, which of these is going to win out? Well, common sense would tell you that as the planet gets warmer, probably the ice sheets are going to get smaller. On the short time scale, that might not be true. But in fact, it turns out now that we have this GRACE, this gravity satellite, which measures the gravitational field so accurately that you can see the changes in the mass of the ice sheets. We see that during the winter, the ice sheet gets heavier. And then during the melting season, it loses mass. But overall, Greenland is losing mass at a rate of uh, probably two to 300 cubic kilometers per year. And also, despite the fact that Antarctica hasn't been warming much except the peninsula, that Antarctica is losing mass. And in both cases, it looks like, although the record is too short for very um, strong conclusions, but it looks like the rate is accelerating. Another expected effect of warming is an expansion of the overturning Hadley circulation so that the, which causes the, the tropics to have heavy rainfall. And then where the air subsides, you have the dry subtropics. But that's expected to expand as the planet gets warmer. And um, there's empirical evidence that averaged over longitudes, it has expanded by about four degrees of latitude. And it's probably one of the things, one of the factors that's affecting uh, the southern United States and the Mediterranean region and also regions in the southern hemisphere. And one of the reasons that Lake Mead and Lake Powell are only half full. And one of the reasons that there's a tendency toward um, hotter conditions in uh, the um, subtropics in the southern United States. And it, th this summer, we have an example. You know, they all, they'll say all these patterns are related to the El Nino, La Nina. Well, actually, the correlation is not very that good with it. But there is a variation with, with uh, ocean temperatures and with the weather. But uh, there's also average effects that we should be looking for. And here's a one of the better climate models projecting what will happen this century to the um, severity of droughts. And you can see that in the subtropical regions like this Mexico, southern US, and the Mediterranean region, and even uh, this whole tier of states in the Midwest uh, going through Oklahoma up through the Dakotas are probably be in trouble if we actually follow that sort of path. Um, and that affects the um, fires. Um, and, and we can see empirically. Again, there are other factors that also influence this, uh, forestry practices and things. But there is a um, clear evidence for increasing uh, fires, not only in the southern US, but in Greece and in Australia and the places where we would expect that. Another thing that's going on is the melting of glaciers. 
all around the world, in the Rockies, the Andes, the Himalayas, the, the Alps, uh, glaciers are melting back. And that has a practical effect because rivers like the Ganges and Brahmaputra, in the driest months, more than half the water in the river is melted ice. So once those glaciers are gone, you will have bigger floods in the spring from the snow melt, but you will have much drier conditions in the dry season. The rivers will tend to run dry. Another effect of this CO2 is on our coral reefs, where, which are under stress, again, for many reasons, but two of the important ones are the warming of the ocean surface, which causes the coral to expel their symbiotic algae and to die, the so-called coral bleaching, and um, the acidification of the ocean. Uh, those, those animals that have carbonate uh, shells or carbonate skeletons are obviously in trouble if the ocean becomes more acid. And um, so there are a, a lot of different things we can use to try to say, well, what is the amount of CO2 that we should limit the system to if we want the system to look like the planet that has existed the last 10,000 years during when civilization uh, developed. And um, I would argue and have argued with uh, co-authors that it probably, you should not want CO2 to be more than 350 ppm on the long run. And maybe somewhat less than that, actually. Uh, and I think our best way to quantify that, I guess I don't have the, well, I, I showed earlier a chart for the energy imbalance. If the planet is out of balance by half a watt, in order to restore that balance by changing the amount of CO2, assuming the other things are unchanged, you would have to take CO2 from 390 back to 360 parts per million. If the imbalance is three quarters of a watt, which is probably more realistic for what it is right now, average over the solar cycle, then you'd have to go back to 345 parts per million. So anyway, it's of that order. If we want to stabilize climate, we've got to restore the planet's energy balance. That means we can't, we, we've, and, and things like ocean acidification, a um, little harder to get an exact number from that, but um, if we want a planet that looks like the one of the, of the Holocene, we'd better um, have a target for CO2, which is less than the current amount. And that means, you know, this, this CO2 has, that we've put in the air by burning fossil fuels has not yet come to equilibrium. It's still being mixed into the ocean. So it will, if we stopped emitting CO2, CO2 in the atmosphere would decline but some of that CO2 will stay there for millennia. Um, of the order of 20% will stay for more than 1,000 years. So there's a limit as to how much we can put there and have any hope of getting back to uh, a safe level before we pass tipping points. And if you just look at, although there's a big, there are big ranges in what the amount of, of uh, undiscovered um, reserves uh, for these different fossil fuels, but we're probably close to peak oil. Use, have probably have used about half of the oil. Um, but there's probably, uh, but, uh, and, and how much coal there is that's is the issue, but, and there are these other unconventional fossil fuels like tar sands. If we would agree to phase out coal emissions over the next 20 years, and if we would leave the unconventional fossil fuels in the ground, then depending upon what these reserves are, CO2 would peak at something uh, certainly less than 450 ppm and, and begin to decline. And if we had aggressive programs for reforestation and better soil management, uh, you, we could get uh, the CO2 back below 350 ppm. So it's technically possible, but it would require this quick phase out of coal emissions. Um, and it would require leaving um, tar sands and other things in the ground. Um, 
And that's, of course, not what's happening. We're uh, continuing to build coal-fired power plants all around the world, and which have a lifetime of 50 or 60 or 70 years, if uh, a potential lifetime. And we're uh, probably in the process of making an agreement with Canada to pipe their tar sands oil to Texas, which would set up um, eventual large amount of um, CO2 from these unconventional fossil fuels. And uh, the and we, we can see that any of the uh, policy attempts to do anything have been completely ineffectual. Uh, subsequent to the Kyoto Protocol, the emissions actually accelerated, um, increasing more about twice as fast as they were before that. So there's this huge gap between the rhetoric and the reality. We have politicians who say we have a planet in peril and we need to do something about that. And, and the policies are basically um, small perturbations. Even the proposed policies are small perturbations uh, to business as usual. Um, so it's a case of uh, governments learning to say the right words, what I call greenwash. Um, but um, they're, they're, they're just in bed with the fossil fuel industry. Money talks in Washington and the other capitals, and uh, the policies, um, they're, they're not uh, proposing policies that would um, solve the problem. And the fundamental problem is that as long as fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, then somebody is going to burn them. And you can't solve the problem with some tricks. The only way... And, of course, the reason that they're the uh, cheapest energy is not that they're inherently the cheapest. They're simply not paying their costs. In some cases, they're even subsidized. But, and indirect subsidies are enormous if you include military costs and things like that for protecting supply lines. But uh, the, they don't pay their cost for human health. If you just added that, the fact when you, a million people a year dying of air and water pollution large fraction of it due to fossil fuels, but those costs are borne by the public, not by fossil fuels, fossil fuel companies. And of course the climate costs, which are being pushed onto our children and grandchildren, are not being borne by the fossil fuels. Um, so the way to solve the problem would be to put an honest price on, on carbon emissions. And it, in order to do this in an economically sensible way, it should gradually increase over time, and the public should know that it's going to increase, and business community should know that this is going to increase. That doesn't mean that regulations and technology development are not required. They are important parts of the problem, but they should be driven by the knowledge that there's going to be this price. Uh, and they would, and that's that's what would make them happen, uh, not some arbitrarily imposed uh, programs to uh, try to achieve that. I don't, I'm not sure why that's there. Um, so what I uh, say is that you need to put a simple fee on carbon emissions, which you collect at the first sale the first domestic sale the, at the mo domestic mine or the port of entry, you collect from the fossil fuel company when it sells it a fee which uh, rises over time and it's just a flat fee, no exceptions, uh, and uh, covers oil, gas, and coal and <laughs> unconventional. Uh, and it would, that's how you would leave unconventional on the ground. As soon as you put on any significant fee, you would never go after tar sands. But um, what you don't want is these cockamamie things cap in trade with offsets. You know, the kind of thing which you are trying to... Uh, waxman Markey bill and things. These are basically... Um, uh, bailouts for big banks and coal companies and oil companies and uh, utilities. The money has to go to the public. 
It's, there's no reason to bring banks into this. The, the problem is you get advisors who, who advise uh, the administration and then they go back to their job on Wall Street. Uh, but there's no, you have these uh, highly skilled trading units at places like Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase, um, which they'll make, they'll make millions and every cent comes from the public. The, 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 they will do fine. They're very good at uh, making money on those things, but there's no reason to bring them into this uh, problem. It, what we want is a, is a simple, honest thing which goes across society so it, it, people will change their long-term uh, practices. And um, so... Um, and it needs to be something that you can make global. There's, it's inconceivable that you can make a cap and trade system global. There's zero chance that China will accept a cap on their economy or India. And why should they? Their emissions, the, two, the CO2 in the atmosphere has increased from 280 to 390. The United States is responsible for 27% of that, China for 9.5%, even though they've got three or four times more people. So it's a factor of 10 to 1 on responsibility, and they're not going to cap their economy. But they have very good reasons for wanting to put a price on carbon, because they don't want to have, be, have fossil fuel addiction the way the United States does, and you have to protect supply lines. Well, they're, on the short term, <laughs> that's the only thing they can do. But on the long term, they're smart enough to know that they've got to, that's, that's not a path, that's not a sustainable path. The fossil fuels are going to run out anyway, so get on a path where you can, um, where you can move to um, clean energies that don't produce um, CO2. And um, um, another opinion, <laughs> I mean, you can see I'm opinionated, but uh, I don't think you you got to be careful with economists too. I, I, um, the uh, <laughs> they're going to they're, they're going to tell you if I got a deal for you, uh, don't let's we can instead of uh, giving the money to the public, let, uh, let me figure out a way to use this money. That's that's the problem. Everybody's going to try to get their hand on on that money, uh, but the fact is. The public needs the money. If they're going to need to make the, the changes uh, on the long run, uh, let them make their decisions and let the marketplace make the decisions. Um, yeah, so here's, uh, you don't have to read this, but this is uh, written by the, um, you, the head of uh, Republicans for Environmental Protection. And um, he's uh, agreeing with something that I'd written about this proposal for fee and dividend. Uh, and uh, he says, well, it makes use of market principles by prodding the market to tell the truth about the costs of carbon-based energy through prices. And it would not impose mandates on consumers or businesses or create new government agencies or add a penny to Uncle Sam's coffers. Um, uh, how would this plan affect individuals? They would, that would depend on how they exercise their right to make free choices. You know, some people say, well, gee, you don't want to just, I, what I'm saying is that you give uh, the money to equally to legal residents of the country. If you put a tax on the, the John Larson rate of increase, which was $15 a ton of CO2 the first year, increasing $10 a ton each year. End of 10 years, $115 a ton, which is equivalent to $1 a gallon on gasoline. And um, that, uh, that would probably, uh, as we will hear later, reduce uh, the emissions by the order of 30% in 10 years, um, which uh, uh, my point was, so that, and it would produce, with the current e e rates of fossil fuel use, that would produce about $600 billion a year. 
uh, which is two or three thousand dollars per legal resident of the country. Um, so a few hundred dollars a month. Uh, so some people say, oh, well, that person's just going to go out and buy beer. You know, he's not going to change his practice as well. Yes, I mean, maybe somebody will do that. But <laughs> in the long run, the person who does that, they're, they're going to figure it out. People aren't. Uh, I, think, I think they need to have their resources. But anyway, his bottom line is then, uh, he says, businesses, um, well, he says, we go to the real bottom line. Transparent, market-based, does not enlarge the government, leaves energy decisions to individual choices, takes a better safe than sorry approach to throttling back oil dependence and keeping greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Sounds like a conservative climate plan. And the main point is that this is, because of the time constants, this is a matter of intergenerational justice. And the public, if they understand this, uh, I think will be supportive. It's the it's nature of, of our, um, our system and our history, and, uh, and for other cultures also, for um, Native uh, Americans and others, and, and religions. And um, governments uh, need to start serving the interests of the public instead of uh, the lobbyists. And the public, uh, I think, is going to have to get more involved. Um, yeah, so this is my two newest grandchildren, my son's children. And uh, Jake is very big for his age. The charts say he's going to be two meters high, if you believe long extrapolations. Uh, and he thinks he can protect his baby sister, who's two and a half days old in this photo. But his parents know better. I mean, he uh, he's, uh, has a very extreme peanut allergy, so they have to have this needle always ready to give him a shot in case he... Uh, but um, the, and that's uh, his baby sister a few months later. I don't know what she's thinking about there. But um, so her, her cousin, now Sophie, is now 12 years old. So decided we have to try to do something about this, so she's writing a letter. So we wanted to make this website called Million Letter March. Try to get the public to start understanding and, and participating in this uh, topic. So we wanted her to write a letter just, you, know, you could just pretend she's writing a letter so we can take a photo for the website. But she actually wrote a letter <laughs> and uh, on the spot. And then she was, you can tell from the look on her face that she thought I was going to like her letter, because among other things, she said, why don't you listen to my grandfather? <laughs> and uh, Connor and her were celebrating her good letter. But, um, uh, and, you know, I have some, a couple sources of uh, optimism, and that is that I think China does, first of all, they don't deny the science. You, I've been over there, and the government doesn't deny the science. And they're run, the government's run by engineers. And they also, I think they're being economically very smart because they decided they're really going, to, going to invest in this stuff. And now they're the number one producers of solar and wind and, and building 30 nuclear power plants. And um, they will want to sell this stuff. It's the stuff where we had the potential to be number one in the world, and we just have not um, taken advantage of it. And we, we're losing, if we don't get going quickly, we're going to... Um, be second rate uh, very quickly. Um, the, there's some hope in the legal approach. Did I, have you I used my time? Oh, okay. So let me just say one final thing. Uh, I, I won't even talk about the legal approach because, in fact, the legal approach, legal approaches don't um, work until the public is behind them. The legal approach worked in civil rights. Finally, the courts said, the gov told the government, you've got to give equal rights. But that was because the public had started getting in the street and started getting arrested and started. Um, so we've got to get um, public involved. I think, I think young people need to get um, 
I don't know if getting Tea Party mad is the necessary, but if you got to get you got to get upset, and you've got to demand uh, the young people got to demand their their rights, and um, I uh, the the royalties from my book go to 350.org. Now, if I write another book, I will give them to Citizens Climate Lobby because they're really starting to do something uh, where they're. They're trying to uh, in influence Congress people and um, get them to understand that we should have an honest price on carbon. And because it's not enough to say that there's a problem and demand uh, uh, senators do something, because then they come up with these cockamamie things like cap and trade with offsets. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, and I want really to focus not on climate science. I think we have had very good presentations. Yeah. And uh, this morning, um, I really want to talk about kind of what was the last slide of those presentations we had before. Because really, we need to do something about that. And I think in Europe, people believe in climate science. They think this is something that is serious and we need to act. Still, um, it is a big challenge uh, we have ahead of us because you have to mobilize in Europe 500 million people in order to rally behind that. Because without that, governments are not going to do anything. Let me start with saying what the kind of philosophy is we are um, having within the European Commission on climate policies. I'll tell you a little bit about our main elements on the EU climate and energy policy because I believe there is a huge misunderstanding particularly also in the United States in terms of what we are trying to do, where are we going to head, and also say a few words then about where we think we need to go in the long term, and then come with the conclusions what you should take home, of course. One thing, of course, is that if you look at climate policy, it's a very young policy area. We only know about the problem for a bit more than two decades, so policy is always reacting slowly until you get people convinced, until you get the constituencies behind you, until the politicians are able to put that into their programs, it takes some time. And also, it is not the only policy objective. There's many other policy objectives of governments. And that is what you really have to reconcile if you start working on a completely new policy area. And so there's one thing that's economic efficiency. Everybody is concerned that you introduce a policy, it's going to cost money, so taking money out of the pocket of the consumer, that is something that you need to take into account. But you also, from our point, said you need to do it in an efficient way. So it's really the pricing policy you have uh, that you need to affect. Uh, whether it's a tax or something else, I come to that later, what works in Europe. But you also need to look at, and Jim was referring to that, that there's other benefits of those policies. And you need to communicate to your constituencies on what is good there. And I think you also need to talk about technologies. And I think the approach in Europe taken is trying to be technology neutral. Uh, somebody was talking this morning about silver bullets. Of course, individual companies, they want to sell their silver, silver bullet but in the end, it will have to be a mix in order to achieve economic efficiency. Energy security is a big issue in Europe. Uh, we are dependent on a lot of gas and fossil fuels that come from very few areas in this world. And um, so the diversification is part of the debate we are having in Europe, reducing import dependence. Uh, and that plays particular when we talk about renewables. But then comes the whole issue of competitiveness. It's not only that we pick money out of the pockets of individual consumers, but we are going to hamper certain industries. And a lot of energy intensive industries, they are very worried. And like Jim was saying, they are not only on Capitol Hill, they are also in huge numbers in Brussels, in Berlin, London, Paris, where they are lobbying for their interests. And that is part of the democratic process and the democratic fabric of our countries and we have to look into this in terms of level playing field and particularly when you take a leading role as Europe, we with our little 12% of global emissions, uh, we want to turn around the big ship. 
that is a big task because it means you also do a disfavor to your industry vis-a-vis -vis industries in China. And Jim, you were referring to the big growth of solar industry in China. That was on the back of European subsidies mainly over the last years. So this is something we need to see these interrelationships. And then jobs. I think um, if I would be an American, I would have to put jobs on top of the list here. That is what is dominating the agenda. It is very important in Europe as well. Uh, at the moment, employment, unemployment rates are rising. So we always have to look in our policies on impacts on jobs. And then the other complicating factor is, OK, Europe. Europe is a bunch of 27 member states. And there's a whole constitutional issue in terms of subsidiarity. At which level should we do certain things? At which level should we introduce certain policies? And that is a constant discussion between the federal level. I shouldn't say federal, but I think I can use that word in the US to um, show what I mean. Uh, whether we want to do it at the European Union level or whether we want to do it at the level of member states. And then what we also have in Europe is very uneven um, a level of, um, of wealth among the consumers. Uh, we have the richest country, which is Luxembourg, and the poorest country, that is Bulgaria. And there is, that is about 20 times difference in terms of the wealth level. And that is something you also need to take into account when you try to design a climate policy in Europe. So there's a, a plethora of objectives that you have to cater for when you think of climate change in Europe. Also, we believe in Europe that there is not a single policy uh, that is going to make the day. Um, and sometimes when I listen to the debate in the United States, and even Jim, when you were talking about cap and trade, the European approach is not just a cap and trade. It's a plethora of policies. And we talk about push policies and pull policies. So some of them you try by setting market prices, pull certain technologies that are going to be bought by consumers and put into, into the market. And others is pushing things out through giving money to research and technology development. I think this is what I want to explain a little bit more in the next slides in terms of how broad the policy is, has become over the last 10 years in Europe. And of course, I will start with the flagship of the European Union um, policy. That's the EU emissions trading system. We have a target um, of minus 21% reduction by 2020 compared to the year 2005. So we are going to set a cap. And I think what is important here, and I heard that also in Jim's presentation, Jim was saying it's a cap on the economy. It's not. I think this is something we need to get through because a lot of people believe that, that you cap the economy. We don't cap the economy. We cap emissions. The economy can grow as fast and as quickly as the economy wants, but what we need is we need to reduce emissions. So it's the cap on emissions. We cover all large industrial and power sector installations, and we treat them similar in all member states. From 2012, and you see that now very nicely in the headlines in the newspapers, we also try to include aviation. And it's not only the domestic flights, but it's also flights that come, for instance, from Washington to Brussels or from Washington to London or from Beijing to Berlin, whatever. All these we intend to cover, but we have a big discussion with those. And next week I'll be in ICAO in Montreal in order to explain to other countries how this is going to work. So this carbon price is giving us a big pull over time. And I think this pull is even in place uh, no matter whether these allowances that are being distributed are given for free or whether they are auctioned. Um, in the beginning, when we had to get the system in place, of course, there was a lot of anxiety on the side of industry. So it was just impossible to say, we are going to auction from tomorrow. It's always nice to think that, OK, we need an honest and simple approach, but you have to deal with people and you have to deal with industries and to convince them. Otherwise, it's not going to fly in the parliament. So free allowances was the start. But we are now moving, as of 2013, 
where we are going to probably auction something between 50 and 60 percent of the allowances, and that will drive more efficiency into the entire system. The long-term signal is given because our target in Europe is not something that ends in 2020. This piece of legislation is going to stay, and what it says is every year we are going to strengthen and tighten the cap by 1.74 percent. So you can extrapolate. You can extrapolate to the year 2050, then we are at minus 70 percent for that whole industry. And that means that all the investment decisions will have to take this carbon price that is going to evolve into account. Let me come a few remarks on the carbon price, because very often when I talk to people, people say, and I heard it also in Jim's presentation, talking about an honest carbon price. People say the carbon price in Europe is too low. Yes, of course, it is too low in order to drive certain policies. But what's the reason we have that low carbon price? There can be two reasons. One is that you dish out too many allowances, and that is, I think, what was our experience in Europe in the first three years, where in the beginning the market was expecting, oh, that is a very tight cap, prices moving up to 30 euros per tonne of carbon dioxide. The first report came in, we saw what the real emissions were, the price fell down, at the end it was 50 euro cents. So that was clearly over allocation. Today we think it's different that the price is low. It is, it shows that there is so much, I would say, fat in the system in terms of you through little adjustments can become and make your industry very much more efficient um, you just send out your engineers and they'll immediately find a few solutions in, e in every industrial in installation to reduce CO2. And therefore, the carbon price at the moment is very low. But that also, let's say, I think is important in the political process because there were many people who said, oh, these carbon prices are going to go through the roof. The industry will have to adjust within a very short period of time, but that is not true. It's a gradual change that is going to take place, but you have already a long-term signal. But the emissions trading, as you can see, covers only part of the European emissions. The other part, transport, the other part, um, individual heating in houses, is covered by individual targets of each of the member states where they have to reduce. And that is set member state by member state. And it is a wide range of targets. In some countries, you can see here on the right-hand side, you have Bulgaria, the poorest country. It is allowed still to increase its emissions because they are at an early stage of development. It still means that it is a reduction against their business of usual. Their business of usual was almost twice as high as the plus 20% you have here. So it is a reduction also in Bulgaria against business as usual. The tightest caps you have in the richest countries in Europe, and that is Luxembourg, Denmark, Ireland, and Sweden. And by doing this on this basis to take into account, okay, what's your capability in working on climate change? We believe that this is also gathering a lot of um, support for climate policies in those countries. And we believe that this, to a certain extent, is a model for the rest of the world. When we talk internationally to India and China, correct, their emissions are much lower, their per capita emissions are much lower, their responsibility is lower, their capability is lower. So I think we can reflect that in terms of how international climate policy is going to be, um, to be designed. And this is one way where you say solidarity is an important aspect and we need to take that into account. I believe probably also you will have the same issues when you would talk about climate policies in the United States. How do you deal with poorer households when your electricity bill is going to go up? How are you going to assist them? But then there's other elements that come in because we don't think that the carbon price alone is going to push really into the right direction. So therefore, we even have a distinct policy on renewables where we have set a target for the year 2020 to increase the renewables part to 20%. And there, again, it is 
um, a target that is being distributed to individual member states because richer member states, we think, can spend more money on renewables than poorer member states can. So again, here there is an element of solidarity in the European policy. In terms of how this is being driven, how do you make sure that you are going to achieve your target, that is left to the individual member states. And you will see um, different approaches in different member states. Sweden, for instance, has chosen a green certificate trading. Germany, all you know, is, um, has chosen the route of feed-in tariffs. And I think there is still a big debate among economists what is the most efficient route in order to drive it forward. Both policies, um, they are going to give you price signals, and both policies should make sure that you are going to achieve your target. Uh, there is some criticism that a lot of the feed-in tariff policies in Europe, that are, they are kind of gold-plated. Um, we have seen that particularly with solar, for instance, where the incentive has been very high, um, so that the energy companies or the companies who provide the technologies were getting a very, very fat windfall profit. Uh, that is part of the debate in Europe also when it comes to the efficiency of climate policies. Another area that is very important for us is research, development, and large-scale demonstration. If we want to get there where we want to move to, we have to accelerate dishing out technologies. And uh, one of our big programs we are embarking on at the present point in time is large-scale demonstration on carbon capture and storage, um, where we do not know whether this is a technology that is going to work. We have set a policy framework in Europe, a legal framework on under which conditions you can do it, uh, because there's a lot of questions in terms of liability that you need to address. So that um, uh, legal framework is in place. And now we have uh, set aside something like 300 million allowances from the emissions trading system uh, that will be monetized by the European Investment Bank. And then we will um, support up to 12 large-scale CCS projects in Europe in order to see whether this is a technology that can work. Because that technology can be a game changer, and is a game changer whether it's going to work or whether it's not going to work. If it's not going to work, it has major implications in terms of what the energy mix is possible to look like in future. And I think there I would agree with Jim, you will have to run out of coal very quickly if you don't have CCS as a technology option. In other areas like transport, which is also not part of our emissions trading system, we have set standards and we have set very tough standards over the coming years in order to move down and improve the fuel efficiency of cars. We have biofuels policies in order to try to bring biofuels in, but we also have a huge amount of taxation on our fuel prices and I was uh, smiling when I heard Jim that, okay, you propose a tax which would increase the price per gallon by one dollar. Um, I asked my colleagues yesterday, what's the price today in Brussels for a gallon of um, gasoline, of gas? It's 8.6 US dollars. Um, still, that, and we have that already for a couple of years, that there's about 50 to 70 percent of the price at the pump is um, taxation. If you turn that into um, euros per ton of carbon dioxide, you talk about something like 200 to 300 euros per ton of carbon dioxide that you put on the transport sector. Uh, economists will now all get gray hair or their hair will fall out and say, why do you allow a 10, or 10 euro price in the emissions trading system on a transport side you are saying you, people could afford a 200 um, euro tax. I think this has to do with consumer preferences. That's a, even at um, that high price, we see that people are not giving up on mobility. So it is, a, I know, it's a sneaky way of get, picking money out of the pockets of consumers, but it's also a good way of driving innovation uh, in the automotive industry, because without that, we are not going to solve the problem. We know that emissions from the transport sector, that's the one sector in Europe, emissions are still growing very fast. 
And what it also does is that it puts ourselves, you can see here, a comparison between different countries in terms of fuel efficiency standards. We are at the front end in the year 2020. And it's our industries, it's Mercedes, BMW, Renault, you name them, they are at the forefront when it comes to fuel efficiency in engines. You can look at the statistics of the OECD in terms of patents. I think it's Europe has more than 50% of all patents related to energy and fuel efficiency of uh, car engines. Um, it shows that this policy can also lead to innovation and it will give a cutting edge to your policy. And what you can also see is that over time, the others are going to follow. So in this case, I think European leadership works because the others also come. Because they still, we have 500 million consumers and I think relatively rich consumers in Europe. We want to drive cars and others want to sell cars to us and they will have to, of course, uh, adhere to the same kind of standards. Another piece of legislation is in terms of reducing the CO2 content of fossil fuels. So it's also something we are working on where we are running into political problems on the tar sands at the moment with Canada, but it's something we are pursuing um, into the future. Uh, we have regulations, um, again, something that's not under the carbon market on fluorinated gases, very potent uh, um, um, greenhouse gases. Um, where we have put regulation in place already in the year 2006. Uh, that also covers mobile air conditioning, uh, and that is very successful in uh, limiting the growth in those F gases emissions. And there we hope that we can even move further in the coming year. And now I'll just give you on a little sheet those policies I'm not going to talk about, but that are also in place at the same time. Um, and that also helped to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we have an energy efficiency target, we have energy services directives, eco-labeling, you name it. So we are trying to tackle the problem from very different angles. When I talk to my colleagues in Brussels, I always say, you see, the battle against climate change, that's not something like the Romans did, where they knock on your front door and they say, please come out and I want to have a fight with you. No, it's like a guerrilla fight. You have to come through the windows, the roof, the cellar from all ends if you want to be successful on climate policies. So it's not a single bill that is going to solve the problem. So even thinking that Waxman Markey, Waxman Markey would have kind of brought you to where you wanted to be, uh, that was not possible. A quick rehearsal so that you have kind of the dimensions in terms of the main policy instruments we have. The ETS covers around 40% of EU emissions. The non-ETS, so that's the national targets, it's about 50 to 60%. Uh, the F gases is a small amount. There's two areas where we still need to work on, and that is CO2 from land use, land use change, and forestry, something we haven't tackled because we have a positive balance in Europe. Um, those forests, they have been or sucking up every year about 9 to 10% of our emissions. And then CO2 from shipping is an area which is not yet covered. Look into the future, 2050, um, and therefore I think I was um, trying to, to get an answer from uh, before. Uh, where should we be in the year 2050? The European vision is that we should do minus 80% by 2050 in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions compared to the year 1990. You see the red line, that is the current policy line with all the policies I've mentioned. That is where we would go. So there is a big gap there. We need to do much more. And it means that, and I here I agree fully with Jim, a full decarbonization of the power sector by 2050. That is something that we need to achieve. We need to be better in residential and tertiary emissions, in industry, the most difficult part probably is transport, where we will continue to see emissions rising. But then as of 2025, also there, we will have to look at electrification and other ways. Because if you use electricity and you have a decarbonized power sector, that is one way of reducing your transport emissions. If you look in 2050, who will be the big sectors that will be remaining? You will see that agriculture will play an important role. 
You can reduce emissions in many sectors, but agriculture is a difficult one, in particular the non-CO2, so that's the methane. It's very hard to stop cows from farting. Um, and that is an area where we will have residual emissions and we will have to deal with that. The other one is fertilization. N2O emissions is something um, that is uh, an area where it will be difficult. We have also calculated the costs in terms of how much is this going to cost us. Uh, because there is always the big fear, this is going to wreck our economy, this is going to wreck our society. The additional domestic investments we require for the next 10 years, until 2020, is something like a staggering 125 billion euros a year. That sounds like a big figure compared to my paycheck at least. Um, but if you look at it in terms of the total investment that is going into the economy every year, um, we in Europe, we invest something like 19% of all our GDP back into the economy. It's an increase of 1%, 1, 1 1.5%. So we believe that this is doable. Still, there's a lot of people in the audience who do not believe that um, and who are much more critical. Um, so it's some convincing that needs to be done. At the moment, we are discussing in the context of our next financial framework in how far from the EU side, we can help um, on this. And now I come to the conclusions, so we have some time for a discussion, uh, which will be very interesting. Um, EU climate change policy is not only about reducing emissions. It's also looking at trying what other policy objectives can you serve and you need to serve at the same time. It is a very young policy area. Um, if you look at the uh, emissions trading system, that piece of legislation was only adopted in 2003 and it entered into force in the year 2005. So that's six years only. So we are a toddler in terms of policy making. Uh, a lot needs to be done. Putting a price on carbon is key and therefore the EU emissions trading is, one, is the flagship of EU climate policies. Uh, one thing I hadn't mentioned is why have we embarked on emissions trading? Why have we not gone for that honest price on carbon through a tax? The reason is very simple. It's in Europe subsidiarity. Tax legislation in Europe requires consensus among all member states if you want to get that piece of legislation through. In 1990, we already started uh, putting a proposal onto uh, the table of the council, the member states, on a carbon tax. And for 10 years we were battling and there was no way that we would ever get consensus. Emissions trading is decided by qualified majority voting. Um, that is much easier than trying to have consensus because it means, but it's tougher than what you would have to do in Senate. Because for us in the European Parliament to get a majority, you need to get something around 70, 73% of the votes. That is what is a qualified majority um, in the Council and in the Parliament. So um, that is the reason that we were embarking on emissions trading. We have a very broad policy mix and I think this is really a message you to take home. It's not just uh, these crazy Europeans, they do cap and trade and it's not working. No, we have a broad suite of policy that we have been putting and able been putting into place. Um, we, I think, have been able, and we can show that on individual pieces of the policy, being able to accelerate the dissemination of new technologies, accelerate the development of t new technologies. I think the most important thing is that if you look at European GDP since 1990, it has been growing by almost 40 percent, manufacturing growing by 36 percent, and emissions have been going down um, quite dramatically um, since the year 1990. So you can decouple economic growth and emissions. And that is the lesson that is for me the most important in the international negotiations. Because only with that fact I can convince my colleagues from China and from other countries to move forward. And I also agree with Jim on this one that there is reason for optimism. Uh, at the moment, or in this current five-year plan, the Chinese administration has said it wants to regulate CO2 emissions, 
They want to go into cap and trade even, try it out in five big provinces, which cover, I was told, 200 million people. So uh, not far from the size of the United States. So this is what's in the cards at the moment um, with the Chinese policymakers. So others are moving slowly, um, and we will, I think, in Europe continue to set the example and try to lead by example. Next time, I'm going to change that picture and also put one of my grandchildren's on it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, now we have some time just for discussion. We had a splendid uh, uh, demonstration so far. Scientists, policy makers, the scientists tend to uh, propose a unique solution, which is a carbon tax, carbon price. The European uh, experience is uh, a broad set of solutions, including carbon price, carbon trading, uh, renewable energy, uh, high tax on use of fossil fuel, as you saw, $8.50 per, per, per uh, um, gallon. Um, a huge uh, sort of, um, set of tools, and um, it's now very interesting, I think, to co uh, contrast these two uh, views, U.S. and Europe, and particularly these two talks now here. So we can uh, have time, uh, probably 20 minutes or so, for a discussion. So, yeah, in front. Uh, could I could I first correct one thing? Oh yes. That you said I I I'm not proposing a one one. Uh, element solution. The, the, only, the reason that a carbon price is, is essential and it has to underlie everything, but it's not a single thing. And I, I mentioned that you need standards, but vehicles is a good example. A dollar a gallon is not going to stop a rich person from buying a, a thing that goes one mile to a gallon. So you've got to have efficiency standards. You need building standards. There are a lot of things. And you need uh, technology development. You know, one of the the hugest problems, a terrible policy of our government, which is, was uh, when Jimmy Carter uh, terminated uh, advanced develop, ad, ad development of advanced nuclear power, and then Clinton uh, really closed the door on it. Um, so it, things like that are important also, because if you don't have an alternative to fossil fuels, then you're in trouble. You know, that's, so we, there are other things important besides a, a carbon tax, but the, the, that needs to underlie things, and it'll make everything work better if you have it. Mr. Walker, <laughs> Okay. And then you, next sure. thing. Uh, you have very contrasting views of what should be done and what is practical and can be done. Uh, maybe uh, there's some overlap over there. What is the experience of uh, carbon taxes in Europe? I understand that it is a sweet that it's a carbon tax. Uh, we have maybe one, two, three uh, questions first, and then you both answer. Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. so maybe you have three questions. Yeah. Because we have so many questions now coming up. So yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm with EcoFest, and actually, if you're a toddler, we're a baby. We've been working for 20 years on actually getting information to the public about uh, environmental changes. A couple of things I wanted to ask. We have certain problems right now with the um, uh, solar. A lot of our solar companies are, are not succeeding. Uh, we've been trying to, to support them. One of the things we're trying to do is, is support them. And, I wonder if you had a comment on what we might do to help uh, support the solar industry. And the other thing is we have a, a political issue, a tremendous political issue. Uh, uh, we just had a, a problem with the clean air issue with our president. And I think uh, I'd like to hear you perhaps address that. One more. Should we add? Uh, one more. You can do it a second round. You know, Ed, go ahead, but then we can do a second round. I wonder if you could explain how it is that it is possible to tax gasoline 
in Europe, although it is not possible to develop a carbon tax. Um, could you give us a little idea of the history of that and how that came about? Okay, so you was the reply first, yeah? Do you want to go first? Uh, I'd like to comment on two of them. Uh, Sweden is a, is a really good example. Sweden is actually the most successful, I think, of any nation in terms of reducing its, I think it's got a 40% reduction already in emissions, and it's, uh, and it has been, it has, and there, furthermore, um, so, uh, uh, that's, it shows, it shows it can, uh, it is possible to get big reductions, but um, the other one I wanted to comment on was the solar, uh, where, again, it's an example of where I think the market should be making the decisions rather than us specifying the technologies and giving, because, you know, I, <laughs> I've invested uh, $75,000 on my house with solar on my barn, large barn, uh, with solar panels, and it makes sense for me personally because you got a 30% of that paid back by taxpayers, federal taxpayers, and $17,500 by Pennsylvania taxpayers. And furthermore, there's some ways that the utility ratepayers are paying me also uh, through increased rates because this, this does, actually causes the utilities to have more higher expenses and they, they increase their rates. And so as long as it's 1% of the people doing this, uh, it's great for that 1%. But you can't, if you try to expand that, say, well, let's, why doesn't everybody get their electricity? Well, then all of those costs, you've got to go on each individual. So it doesn't, it's not economically sensible. Uh, at this time. And the, the idea that, well, maybe we'll push an industry and it'll come up with something much cheaper. Well, yeah, but that decision shouldn't be made by congressmen. It should be made by the market. This is those next three questions. Oh, no, sorry. So we have the first uh, uh, chance to uh, no, give. Maybe start, start with the last oh. one. I, I, okay. I, I agree with Jim about in terms of Solar is the most expensive technology in order to produce electricity. So in terms of government support programs, you can only do a very limited amount. And we even see that in Europe, uh, where there were some ambitious um, solar support programs. And now with the economic financial crisis, governments had to um, turn them down. Um, like in Spain, for instance. And that, of course, is a big disruption then to the businesses. Uh, so then you get into a very volatile situation. Um, it's better to work with a long-term um, gradual increase, um, and then you, you, you build up your industry with that. But uh, if you can't uh, sustain such a support policy, I think it's really questionable whether it is all that good. Although solar policy in Europe has um, kind of reduced the cost of production uh, per, uh, per unit quite drastically, and that is where, why the Chinese, let's say, they are now capturing something like 15 to 20 percent of the, in the global solar market were so successful because they were able to cut those costs. Carbon tax, yes, indeed. In Sweden, the carbon tax is there already for quite a number of years, and it has been, as Jim said, very successful. Still, that doesn't mean that this carbon tax moves automatically to Finland, to Germany, to other places. Because setting taxes um, is something where you need majorities in the parliament. And it's not something that is very popular. Um, and one of the reasons why it is not popular in Europe is because we have already very high energy taxes and very high fuel taxes. And the argument that is often used um, to against the carbon tax was, but we have already these huge fuel taxes. So why do you want to do double regulation and... Um, put just one thing onto the other. A tax discussion and debate uh, in Europe is as difficult as in the United States. We shouldn't forget that. Um, there was one on the clean air issue. Fuel or No, tax? the president has recently been saying, I'm, I'm not sure whether I want to comment on that. <laughs> but 
I think it just shows, and I'll do that from a kind of more politics point of view. It just shows um, how vulnerable any kind of policy is to uh, which cycle in the economy we are in. Do you get the support from the people or not? Um, sometimes I believe lawmakers have in their drawers very good proposals where even the economics make hugely sense. Still, there is no way that you can get them out, put them, because you know that you are not going to find the majorities that are required to get the change in Congress and Senate or in Europe in the, in the different parliaments. If I, if I could just add to this, uh, can you make a carbon tax global? Uh, in fact, you don't need to get the approval of each country. All you would really need to make it work is a big block that says we're going to do this. Because the WTO regulations would allow you to put a border duty on products from countries that do not have a carbon tax. And it would be very disadvantageous to a country not to have a carbon tax once there is a big block that has it. So what we need is, I, my, my uh, best hope was that, well, China will see the light and make a deal with the European Union. And then I would force the United States to, to join. Uh, but we've got to get the Europeans to understand this. <laughs> You want to quickly reply because you are came with the argument of the subsidiarity principle in Europe. So the tax decisions are made on different levels. No, but um, on this proposal, whether China and the EU could come together in order to enact a big carbon tax. Um, you see, in Europe, we we have fuel taxes, which kind of is a is a proxy also to a carbon tax. Of course, in your constituency, you can put up taxes. And we have very high fuel taxes in Europe. Um, and it means that um, kind of we get, a, the economists, they will say that you get a, a big rent which you put into uh, the government coffers. Uh, why is Saudi Arabia or Russia not doing something and trying to capture that rent uh, by putting export taxes on what they export? Because that is the way of um, distributing rents around the world. It, it has never happened um, so far. And I think in the same way, it will be very hard to believe that um, China would agree to something like that. Then the, the next thing is that even with the carbon tax or the fuel tax we have in Europe, which is so high in terms of CO2 content, um, we see emissions in the transport sector still growing. So let's say there is a question of what is the right level of the carbon tax. And that is interesting because we have that, de we have that debate as well. Uh, because you have the poor people in Europe saying in Bulgaria, uh, whose I don't know, monthly income is below 1,000 euros, and you have others who have a much higher um, income per capita. And then the others say, oh, if you want to have an EU-wide tax, then it has to have different tax levels. Uh, and the same debate you would get with China. So how effective it's going to be in the end, I'm not quite sure. Um, and whether they would agree to that. But it's certainly something, uh, we explore many things with China, um, which uh, we can ask them whether they would be interested in doing this. Now, there, there's maybe a fundamental uh, misunderstanding here. The tax has to be on the consumption. Ah. Ta Saudi Arabia is not going to put a tax on what they sell. Uh, but it, it, the money needs, that's why I say it needs to be at the domestic, the first domestic sale, at the domestic mine or at the port of entry. And the money is, that's collected is given uh, not to Saudi Arabia, it's given to the citizens of that country to allow them to begin to adjust their practices. Okay, I guess, I guess, can, just yeah. one question. I still do not understand because in the end, with that tax, you only affect your own consumers. So it's yeah, the consumers so it has in the to be, EU absolutely. and the consumers in That's China. That. So why would then the United States, they would, let's say, I, I believe the debate would be, 
oh, look, these stupid Europeans and Chinese, they tax their own consumers. We in the States, yeah. we are not going to do that. Well, no, it would, it, the European Union, let's say it's the European Union and China that do it, they would put a border tax uh -huh. on, on products from the United okay. States, and the United States would soon begin to adjust their policies. If uh, GATT is allowing this, so that might be another issue. But that's, maybe, no, that's a very different issue. And, and it's a very interesting issue. Um, because if you look at the European debate, even if you look at the emissions trading uh, directive, you will find a paragraph there that talks about, um, I think it's called um, border equalization mechanism or something like that. So it's something which has been toyed around in Europe. Uh, the big fear, of course, is that, um, like we have seen with other, many other trade measures, that you just cause an extra escala escalation of trade measures. So the United States would say, okay, if you tax me on this, then I'll tax you on that. That's the kind of fabric in terms of trade wars we have been seeing in the past. Well, so I have never seen anybody then saying, okay, if you introduce something on the border, I will um, kind of accept that um, without retaliation. You um, see, that's why we don't want to get down in the weeds of all these details, because this is a very simple thing. We've got a certain amount of carbon in the ground, and we now understand we can't put it in the air. And the only way that that's going to get left in the ground is with a global price on its emissions. Because, you know, the, it's great that the EU is uh, being more responsible than most uh, countries, <laughs> some other countries, <laughs> with regard to making a serious effort to reduce their uh, emissions, but it won't solve the problem. No. It's, like, it's like the Kyoto Protocol. It, you know, if, as long as the fossil fuels in general in the world are not taxed, then somebody else is going to burn them. Even if the EU reduces its emissions, some, it'll just reduce the price a little bit, allow somebody else to burn more. Mm -hmm. exactly. So we've got to have something across the board. Yes, we've got to have politicians yeah, who are honest. Charles, an yeah, uh, expert on carbon tax, so uh, one Three more questions to Charles. Thank you. Um, Charles, take the microphone. Uh, thanks. This is such an interesting discussion. Um, on, on the Bulgaria, maybe three quick points. On Bulgaria, um, the carbon tax is going to be domestic. So all the carbon tax revenue in Bulgaria, from, from a Bulgarian carbon tax, stays in Bulgaria. And if the revenue is distributed with the green checks that Jim is advocating, then uh, probably 60 to 70 percent, maybe even more, depending upon the distribution of income and wealth in Bulgaria, benefit and have more money than they, with the carbon tax than they have today. It's going to be the oligarchs of Bulgaria, and in fact any country, that will be disadvantaged. And uh, that's just too bad. It's a political problem, but it's not a moral problem. Um, in terms of the, the fact that transport emissions still rise despite the very high taxes on petrol, uh, that's because this all has to take place at, at the margin. Uh, the uh, average, the per capita transport emissions in the EU are half, maybe even less than half what they are in the United States. And that can be attributed, many things cause that. But more than anything, it's because of the great disparity in the tax rates on petrol. So the tax rate has to keep rising because otherwise the income effect will you know, eventually cause that to, uh, you know, to, to wane. And, and finally, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of these maybe gray-haired economists who note that, if I have any left, the, the difference between uh, what, what, the $3 per euro uh, petrol tax uh, and the maybe 20 cent, you know, uh, uh, 20, 20, sorry, 20 euro per ton uh, 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 from the carbon tax. And that's because the European countries individually in their terrific wisdom three and four decades ago realized that to save their cities and to save their transport systems, they had to tax the externalized costs of the automobile. Uh, and isn't it the case then that it's mostly in the transport sector that the European countries have this very high fuel and energy tax and not so much on electricity and heating and industry, et cetera? Two more questions. Christian, can you pass this on? I have a question. Uh, there. Thank you. First of all, this is really been excellent and I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to use a microphone. Question. She has a microphone. 
Oh, yeah, okay, good. This is a question about how to move forward in negotiating with the public. I am an ecological artist who works with a scientist, and I just came from a conference at Monteverde that was sponsored by ETH in Switzerland. We were working on ecological novelty and the synergistic effect that's happening so quickly and at a scale that's unprecedented unprecedented between climate change, GMOs, so many factors, population explosion. And the problem we came to when it came to outcomes, and this is what I want to ask, is the culture of science, which should be taking the lead, and Jim is an outstanding uh, disclaimer to this, is that most scientists want to operate from a position of neutrality, and most scientists also operate within a closed system so that it's very difficult for them to collaborate across disciplines, particularly in innovative fields such as art. So I'd, I'd like to hear some comments on that. One more question. British economist Nicholas Stern called climate change the largest market failure in history. And what you've shown in terms of EU policies at the, is that the key aspects of the policy are mandates and or targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, mandates or targets for renewable energy, and incentives like feed-in tariffs to promote alternative energy, especially solar power. In the United States, I see no possibility within the next few years for legislation along these lines at the federal level. The initiative is being taken at the city level, the state level. There are three states that now have plans for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, California, Massachusetts, and New York. Only California, as of April 2011, has mandated 33% renewable energy required by all public utilities by 2020. Would this be an equivalent type of goal that we should aim for in terms of making sure that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and promote renewable energy within the shortest possible period of time. Thank you very much. I think now we turn back to the table here. Any one of you want to start? Well, I would say I think that's a bad strategy. I think the market should make the decisions. Legislatures do not know what the future is going to be, what is going to be the best way to reduce the emissions, the <clears throat> percentage of efficiency, the type of technologies. To, to mandate specific approaches it can be very expensive and, and uh, turn everybody off. They see their utility bills going up, and, and you, you, I don't think that's the way to go. Pick up some questions. Yeah, I'd say if there's one thing where I disagree with uh, Nick Stern, then it's on this uh, market failure issue because I believe it's not an issue of market failure, it's an issue of government failure if nothing is done on, on climate because markets also are created by people. Uh, markets is not something like uh, a moon that is hanging there in the sky somewhere, but it's created by people um, and it's through institutions uh, where you regulate. So it's government failure, uh, what is happening. Um, yeah. What is also very clear from my experience is that, of course, we can talk endless hours in terms of what's the best way of tackling a certain problem, or what is the ideal situation, the ideal way forward. But as somebody said, um, um, probably more powerful than me, is that the best is the enemy of the good. And I think this is what you see in European policies and also in climate policy. It is, we think, a good policy. Uh, from an economist's point of view, I don't think it's an ideal policy. Uh, it could be better, even more efficient, and so on. But as I said, you will have to convince people in parliaments. You will have to convince people who have a lot of fears in terms of that this policy is going um, to make them poor or they will have to sit in houses that are not heated any longer and any kind of interesting stories you hear. You have to compromise with those people and that means any kind of compromise has a certain cost involved. 
So you will never come to a kind of ideal solution. What, you, what the bottom line is in the end is where are the emissions going? Are they going down or are they going up? And is it a policy that you can sustain over time and where you have the public support um, so that people are not withdrawing legislation or turn against it or something like that? I think that is the, um, the art of policy making, really, which is very different, I believe, from the art of science, uh, where the, you probably strive for the ideal uh, and very often in my conversations with scientists, and let's say I started my career in science as well, um, you always get the answer kind of, yes, on one hand this, on, one, on the other hand that, um, but you don't get a straight answer. And in policy, we have to move to a straight decision within a relatively short period of time. We can't wait for the last 10% of uncertainty to be resolved. We have to make decisions under uncertainty, that is very clear. And we have to be bold in a certain way, uh, take into account issues like you know, there's tail ends, whether they are fat or thin, um, in one way or the other, it will have to be reflected in our decision making. I think um, if I could we briefly comment be on that. Nas, <coughs> answer, but then um, we should stop and have lunch. We need to have a system, a framework, which has a hope of working. Mm -hmm. you, and you know, that this, uh, the best is enemy of the good is the basic argument. The, is good good enough? And I, you know, I've sat down with people like senators in Washington and they say, oh, what you're asking for is impossible. You know, we, I can never get uh, others to agree with that. We, what we, 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 so we do these little things that aren't gonna, you know, aren't gonna work no way to make them international. Uh, you have to s step back and look at the whole picture and understand what is needed. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to communicate to the public. And, we sh and what we need is some leaders who will do that. And it's not that hard to do, but so far they, they have n nobody's been willing to do that. Um, I think that um, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's got to be a framework that has a chance of working and solving the problem and leaving uh, much of the carbon in the ground. Otherwise, uh, we're just wasting our time. We will have many more of those uh, topics discussed and coming back probably also so the mitigation policies uh, in the afternoon and tomorrow and particular issue, starting a new issue in the afternoon are there new technologies on the horizon that may help us to reduce uh, CO2 emissions? And there will be two big sessions in the afternoon of other experts. But I have to uh, stop now this session. We have to get some lunch. We have to make a quick decision. And uh, we want to thank our speakers very much for...